Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, so I in this microstructure evolution the first uh, topic which we want to take is dynamic recovery. Okay, so, we want to see that how the dynamic recovery bring the microstructural changes in the material. Okay, so, what is the basis of this dynamic recovery? Okay, so, this we will uh, discuss in this particular lecture. Okay, so, if you kind of define where the dynamic recovery will be an important process. Okay, so, in terms of materials for high staking fault energy materials that means, the staking fault energy of the material which has high staking fault energy these kind of materials show predominantly dynamic recovery. Okay, instead of dynamic recrystallization they show dynamic recovery. Okay, so, dislocation like to recover rather than uh, want to remain inside the grain. Okay. So, in this aluminum alloys one of the very important alloy, alloy system your alpha iron ferritic steel all these are uh, come under high staking fault energy materials okay, and they show predominantly dynamic recovery. And usually if you do deformation at lower temperatures okay, then you will uh, mostly see dynamic recovery in most of the material. Okay, so, at lower temperatures and in the material which has high staking fault energy you will see dynamic recovery as the predominant uh, process through which the uh, restoration of the <coughs> material property takes place excuse me. So, if I want you want to see uh, that how uh, we have already seen I think a stress strain curve uh, for dynamic recovery that how the stress strain curve will look like. Okay, so, usually we say that after the initial part where the strain hardening is taking place the strain hardening is when your dislocation density is increasing dislocation multiplication is taking place okay, that is the part when you will have a strain hardening. And as we have just seen in microstructural evolution that this is the phase where the subgrain will develop. Okay. So, dislocation will multiply okay, they will interact and at the same time all this dislocation rearrangement will take place and form this small subgrains okay, with low angle grain boundary around them. Okay. And these are the initial part of the strain hardening part in the uh, hot deformation process. And after a certain strain okay, you will see that the, the now the stress is independent of a strain that means, you have reached a kind of a steady state process. Okay and with the strain there is no change in the stress. Okay. So, now in this particular segment your dislocation density is constant. Okay. So, dislocation density can be constant when you do not have any generation, okay. but in this case what happens is that the generation and the taking out of this dislocation or annihilation of this dislocation these two processes kind of uh, become equal uh, the rates of these two processes become equal. Okay. So, the dislocation multiplication and dislocation removal okay, from the grain uh, is equal okay, the rate is equal. So, that you do not see any change in the uh, flow stress. Okay. So, dislocation density is constant means the generation as well as the annihilation is constant. Whereas, in the initial process it was predominantly generation and annihilation was uh, the rate was lower. So, that is why you see the strain hardening and usually the subgrain also remain equixed more or less with constant mean size and constant minimum uh, mean misorientation. So, there is not much change in the microstructure also. So, it has reached a steady state condition. So, when you have this kind of condition then we say that the material is deforming through dynamic recovery process okay, that the dynamic recovery process is the prominent 
process in this particular segment. Just as a word of caution, okay, do not uh, think that if uh, a flow curve is continuously showing a strain hardening, there is no recovery there. Okay. If you are doing a high temperature deformation or uh, any deformation more than 0.3 Tm or 0.4 Tm and so on, okay, the recovery will always be there. Okay, the dislocation recovery will keep taking place. Okay, only thing is which process is dominating. So, if you are seeing a strain hardening continuously, for example, let us say stress uh, strain curve, and but it shows a continuous uh, strain hardening. Okay, that means the generation is more, dislocation multiplication is more, and dislocation uh, recovery is less. Okay recovery will take place. Uh, similarly, when the softening is taking place, okay, there may be additional process of let us say recrystallization also, but maybe recovery will be there in that uh, in that condition also. And in the steady state condition, of course, this two matches very nicely and we say that it is predominantly controlled by dynamic recovery. Okay. Now, if you see hot deformation, Okay, uh, I, you can divide the hot deformation this term into two terms. Okay, deformation of course. So whenever you have deformation, there are only two ways which with which you can do plastic deformation through dislocation activity or through twin twinning. Okay, so twinning we, we are not considering here that much. So uh, mainly it is through dislocation movement. Okay. So, when you impose a strain in the material okay, to carry that strain, okay, you need that many dislocations. So, dislocation density will increase with the strain and that is why you see the strain hardening. Okay. So, any deformation process you will have associated dislocation generation and then dislocation movement. Okay. But at high temperature, Another thing which happens is call, uh, what we call as equilibrium vacancy concentration. So, at any temperature above 0 Kelvin, you will have some vacancies in the material okay? and these are thermodynamic defect, uh, vacancy, uh, vacancy is a thermodynamic defect. So, it, is, it, it will always be there and the change of equilibrium vacancy concentration as a function of temperature is exponential. Okay? So, as you in keep increasing the temperature, it will increase exponentially. Now, this <coughs> what this uh, vacancies do is that they actually help in the uh, recovery of the dislocation. Okay. So, if you want to just see a, a relationship, a vacancy concentration in mole fraction is related with activation energy and the temperature. So, temperature is a very important factor here. Okay activation energy will be constant for formation of vacancy. Okay. So, as you increase the temperature, there will be exponential in, uh, increase in the vacancy concentration. Okay. So, now how this vacancies help in the recovery process? So, when you have deformation first, so dislocation will increase, dislocation interaction takes place. Okay. Now, dislocation when the dislocations are involved okay, in absence of let us say temperature also, there will always be some interaction between the dislocation. Okay. So, if you want to see uh, any two dislocation, for example, I take two edge dislocation of same sign. Okay. Now, they will also have some stress field associated with them. Okay. So, you will have a compressive stress field here and tensile here, similarly compressive here and tensile here. Tensile here okay. And if they are close to each other, their stress field will interact okay, and these two dislocation would like to come one ab, uh, over another. Okay. If the dislocation are of not opposite sign, again taking the edge dislocation, okay, that these two dislocation would like to arrange in a way that they are at 45 degree angle to each other. Okay. Okay. So, this is the usual interaction in absence of temperature also this kind of gliding. So, dislocation will move only in its particular slip plane in the slip direction okay. and if they are close enough where their stress field can interact with each other, they would like to arrange in a particular fashion okay. and this is how they will try to arrange. If of the same sign, 
one over another if our opposite sign then uh, at 45 degree angle ok. So, this is this is a usual conservative motion of dislocations ok. Now, when you are at high temperature ok there is an additional movement which you are allowing a dislocation to have and which is what we call as dislocation climb ok which is a non conservative movement ok glide is uh, we consider as conservative movement and the climb as non conservative movement ok. So, just to make you understand this climb process ok suppose again taking the edge dislocation ok. So, I am just drawing uh, hope I am drawing it correctly here this will come here and so on and then there will be next layer ok and ok. So, you have a edge dislocation here which is ending somewhere here ok. So, now let us say there is a vacancy as you increase the temperature there will be more vacancies uh, one vacancy is is jumping ok and suppose it has first come here there is a vacancy here now. Now, this atom sees this vacancies ok then let us say this atom jumps here is now coming here. So, vacancy has moved from this place to this place. Now, this the additional uh, plane which is there for the edge dislocation this particular atom at the end of the dislocation also sees this particular vacancy and it jumps here ok. So, uh, let us erase this one now from here and create this particular one here. So, what you can see here is that the dislocation has climbed by one atomic distance now ok. Ok, so the, what you can see here is that dislocation has climbed by one, one atomic distance ok. So, the vacancy is how they are helping is that this dislocation now climb ok and that is how a dislocation can recover or dislocation can be removed from the grain by this climbing process ok. So, this dislocation climb can happen only when you are at uh, sufficiently high temperature where the equilibrium vacancy concentration is of certain amount ok. Then only it will be effective process for dislocation climb. And also you can see that because temperature is in the diffusion is a temperature dependent process. So, for diffusion of vacancies also you need a high temperature. So, for creation of vacancies as well as our diffusion of vacancies for both you need high temperature then only you will have this kind of climbing process ok. And this type of climbing can keep happening as more and more vacancies are there ok. So, you have dislocation generation due to deformation and you have dislocation recovery through this kind of climbing process dislocation climb. And also this climbing process then uh, helps in kind of rearrangement of dislocation ok. And uh, as I told you that this, this rearrangement you can develop uh, a, a small or low angle grain boundary. For example, let us say I have a crystal like this ok and I am now deforming it ok. So, let us say I have deformed it like this ok. So, now you can see that there is a tensile strain here and compressive strain here. The length is shorter in the bottom and length is more towards the top ok. So, to have this kind of straining definitely I will have to introduce dislocations here ok. Okay. So, initially these dislocations are all randomly arranged ok, but suppose if I also do it at uh, a sufficiently high temperature then what will happen that this dislocation will like to rearrange ok and then this particular crystal again the same strain is there, but now let us say the dislocation are arranged in a particular fashion ok. So, th suppose you have started with a single crystal. Now, you can see that this single crystal is divided into a small subgrains and this dislocation arrangement can create a low angle grain boundary ok. As you must be knowing a model of uh, grain boundary is through 
arrangement of this dislocation like this one over another ok. So, individual grains sub grains are there which is surrounded by this low angle grain boundary ok. That is what you can again see I have say taken the same micrograph here that these are your high angle grain boundary and the grain high angle or uh, bigger grain is divided into smaller sub grain which is surrounded by this low angle sub grain boundaries ok. Now, the another way to look at these kind of uh, sub grains as I told you in optical microscopy you would not be able to see another way to look at it is called ACM channeling contrast. So, using scanning electron microscope and in that there is a technique called channeling contrast. You can now again see that the and uh, again uh, it is channeling contrast actually use the orientation information of the grain to give a grayscale image here ok. So, this is small sub grains which you can see here also I think if you see the scale uh, it, it might match 50 micron is here and there are let us say 5 or 6 grains here so around 10 micron and here it is 20 micron again 10 micron. So, these sub grains are uh, uh, right now in this particular microstructure is around 10 micron ok. So, you can see this small sub grains ok within the grain using this particular technique. So, you can use different technique to view different microstructural features ok. So, a typical recovered microstructure will look something like this with high angle grain boundaries ok and the grain is subdivided into sub grains you and this sub grains will be surrounded by low angle or sub grain boundaries ok. Now, sub grain size also I can uh, kind of uh, uh, quantify ok as you can see that I if I know the sub grain size I can plot a, 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 a relationship between the sub grain size and the normalized stress. For example, in this particular graph what you can see is a normalized sub grain size and this is normalized stress ok. And this you can actually relate with a relationship like this ok. The, so, d is your sub grain size and z here is your z or one parameter. If you remember I think we have discussed it earlier also this z is actually is something like this actually it uh, take into account both the strain rate and temperature in the single parameter ok. So, actually the effect of uh, strain rate is that if you increase the strain rate ok then the flow stress will increase ok because you will have more dislocation and then they, they will interact and so on. The rate of generation of uh, dislocation will be high as you increase the strain rate. If you decrease the temperature again the uh, uh, effect on the stress is that it will be higher the flow stress will be higher as the temperature is lower ok. So, if I want to show stress will be higher when you have higher strain rate and lower temperature ok. So, these two effect is combined in this zener holomben parameter as I told you earlier also. So, when strain rate is high temperature is low means z will be high ok. So, you can see now that there is a relationship between uh, I can kind of have stress the flow stress as function of some function of z that as z increases my stress increases. So, you can see that when the normalized stress is increasing here that means the z must be increasing here and what is the effect of that on the grain size? as the stress is increasing means I can say that my z is increasing in this direction or I can say my strain rate is increasing in this, this direction or and temperature is reducing in this direction. So, as my z is increasing or normalized stress is increasing my grain size is refining ok. So, if now you can see that I can now control the microstructure. If I want a finer sub grain size I have to deform the material at higher strain rate and lower temperature. Now, what is the drawback of that for a practicing engineer for example, if I increase the strain rate and do deformation at lower temperature my flow stress will be higher 
okay. And when the flow stress will be higher that will have impact on all my uh, machinery which I am using. For example, if I am using rolling or extrusion, okay. So, my roll mill has to be designed for that kind of flow stress, okay. I will require higher energy for deformation because flow stress is higher, okay. So, what microstructure I need, okay, for a certain property and how I am going to get it, this is all interconnected, okay. So, when you have normal more normalized stress means you will have finer grain size or finer sub grain size, okay. So, th these are some important relationships in the dynamic recovery process that how the microstructure will be changing. So, you can see that a big grain uh, okay, which is surrounded by high angle grain boundary okay, then kind of get subdivided into sub grains okay, something like this. So, these are all low angle grain boundaries. Okay, and this size is again controlled by the deformation uh, parameters which is our strain rate and temperature. Okay, so, these all are controlled together to give you a certain microstructure. Okay. In recovery mostly we will say that, uh, that there is no if you see a optical microscope you would not be able to see any big change in the microstructure. Of course, they, the grains will be elongated because of the deformation process, okay. but with different strain you would not be able to see only the it will get elongated more, okay. but uh, other than that you would not be able to see much change. Okay. The texture also would remain more or less similar, okay. there would not be much change in the texture of the material. Okay. But internally there is a refinement through subgrain uh, formation and the uh, change in the subgrain size. Okay. So, thank you with this our dynamic recovery part is over. Okay. Now, we will discuss dynamic recrystallization.